Well, please turn your Bibles to the book of Colossians and find chapter 1 and verse 1 and word 1 where we'll focus our attention this morning. This morning we're going to look at the author of the book of Colossians. We won't get to the book of Colossians until next week, but today we look at the author, Paul. And in no way are we going to minimize the divine author, understanding that no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. But this man, Paul, we hear from him in a letter to the Colossians, is a man who God used uniquely. An apostle that was gifted by God precisely and empowered specifically to shape the early church. Paul set the trajectory of the apostolic church on a path that would change the course of the world. As we consider Paul's life today, a glimpse of Paul's life today, what you'll find that for Paul, though he was a man of many labors and many toils, much fruit and much failure, Over all that Paul did was Christ. Christ was over all for Paul. Christ was the motivation. Christ was the power. Christ was the purpose. In the life of Paul, Christ was over all. So it should be no coincidence that as we unfold the letter Paul wrote to those in Colossae, we find the theme of this book matches the theme of Paul. moment to soak in this example that Paul leaves for us and consider our own lives. Could we label our lives Christ over all? Again, we'll just look at Paul's life this morning, but I want us to get our feet wet in the book of Colossians. So stand with me. We'll read Colossians chapter one in the first eight verses as we begin. Colossians chapter one, beginning in verse one. Apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God and truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He's the faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you'll help us this morning. Help us to look into our lives, to recognize our Savior, to see where we're pursuing Him, to see where we must pursue Him. Help us with humility to long for a life that looks more like Paul as Paul followed Christ. Father, help us because we need it. This life is so full. This world is so needy. The chaos around us can distract us. So help us to slow down, to take a moment, to look back, to look within, and to look to you for help. Father, we we want a life like this that's lived for you. So we just ask that you'll help us see what we need to turn from, what we need to turn to that we might make much of you. We ask in our Savior's name. Amen. We can be seated. Colossians chapter 1 begins Paul. What Paul, what made Paul such a powerful follower of Christ? That's what we're going to see today. We'll see four answers to that question or four attributes or four pursuits or four characteristics of Paul and that made him such a powerful follower of of Christ. The first one we'll see is Paul was a passionate worshiper of Christ. But let's begin at the beginning. Paul was not always a passionate worshiper of Christ. Something happened to Paul. 
And remember, Paul's name, and when we first meet him, was Saul until Christ changed it to Paul. I'll keep calling him Paul because I get confused. So just, he's, he's Paul. You know who I'm talking about. Paul was born between 5 and 12 AD. That's as narrow as we can get that. He is born, born in Tarsus of the Roman province Cilicia, modern-day Turkey. You can check out this map if it'll help you. I'll try to orient you on the map if you can see in the bottom right corner there's a circle around the city a green circle around jerusalem if you follow yourself north along the mediterranean coast just to where the armpit is they would be offended by that that's tarsus in the ancient province of cilicia if you took a 300 mile plus or minus crow trip to the west you'll see the next green circle is Colossae. That's where the recipients of this letter were from. But back to Tarsus around 5 to 12 AD. Paul is born to an industrious family of Jewish parents who took their religion seriously. And according to Acts chapter 22, verse 3, I'm a Jew born in Tarsus and Cilicia, but brought up in this city. Do you know that? Paul was brought up in Jerusalem, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are this day. So in essence, that's what we know about Paul prior to his conversion story, that he was born in, in Jerusalem. You see, before Paul was a passionate worshiper of Christ, Paul lived a life of works steeped in a self-righteous identity. Paul studied under one of the most prestigious rabbis of his day, Gamaliel. He pursued the law, both its content and its following, as well as the additions of the law by the Pharisees, and he pursued all of that with a great zeal. Paul was a man of the law, but not the pure law of God. He was a man of the law in his day. The law of God plus the law of man. And as you study Pauline biographical sketches, you can almost find a reverence for Paul prior to his salvation. The idea that Paul was pretty much saved, he just needed a little bit of information to get him over the hump. I think Paul would have had a great problem with that. He, he had what he needed, but he didn't pursue Christ. I love Paul as much as the next guy, but prior to Paul's salvation, Paul was an adamant enemy of Christ's church, not by default, but on purpose. Paul had rejected the Messiah that the Old Testament predicted, and Jesus clearly and prophetically and profoundly fulfilled. Paul not only rejected that Messiah, but he rejected the message of that Messiah, and he not only rejected the message of that Messiah, but he rejected the messengers of that Messiah. And you say, well, where's the proof? It surely wasn't, it wasn't that bad. Paul wasn't that bad of a guy. He just needed somebody to come alongside of him and ask him, are you a good person? The people that laughed have been at Grace Bible Church a while. But there are a lot of details left out of Paul's early life. But what we know is that it's being educated, and according to tradition, Gamaliel normally educated his men from about the age of 16 for the next 10 years. It's a long commitment. If Paul was born between 5 and 12 AD, I understand that's a broad swath, but when he went to Jerusalem at the latest age 16, it had been somewhere around the year 25 for the next 10 years. So that means he was in Jerusalem studying under Gamaliel from 25 AD. Meaning Paul was in Jerusalem and the surrounding region around Jerusalem when someone else's famous ministry was happening. Jesus. Jesus was crucified, buried, and raised from the dead while Paul was in a Jewish seminary with blind eyes and broken ears, seeing and hearing plenty, but seeing and hearing nothing. What's all that mean? Well, it means that Paul knew all of the earthly angles about Jesus. It means Paul knew all he wanted to know about Jesus. 
It means Paul knew all he cared to know about Jesus. It means Paul was studying while Jesus was ministering. It means those who Paul looked up to provided his teaching to him. Those who that he followed their works-based religion of Judaism, those were the ones who murdered Jesus. And we have no reason to believe that Paul and Jesus ever interacted prior to Paul's conversion. In fact, I think we have a reason to believe they didn't interact. But Paul knew enough about Jesus and Jesus's ministry and his claims and his teaching, which we would call the gospel, to completely and fully, emphatically, religiously reject everything about Christ. You see, Paul not only rejected the message of that Messiah, but the messengers of that Messiah. He didn't just reject them. He chased them down with fervor and zeal and murdered them. Philippians 3, 6, Paul describes himself as a zealot persecutor of the church. Go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 7. We find the story of Stephen's gospel proclamation in front of the high priest and the ruling council. It's an incredible sermon. It's one of the most Beautiful sermons in all of the New Testament. You can summarize it by saying this. It's the gospel. And what you find is this gospel presentation by Stephen to the religious Jews. It got him killed. Acts chapter 7 verse 54. We'll skip a few but we'll start there. Now when they heard these things. There, it's a reference to Stephen's whole sermon. They were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. Look at verse 57. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him, and witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. What do you see about Saul here? We see that Saul heard everything that Stephen said. Read Stephen's sermon. If you've never read anything in the Bible, what you'll see in Stephen's sermon is what you need to get to heaven. And Paul said, nah, kill this guy. The men who were leading the religion Paul was following, they were manipulating people like Paul to kill those still following and proclaiming Jesus. But Paul was no puppet. as a leader in this endeavor. He was so respected as to not need to get his hands dirty. Oh, Paul, we'll do the stoning. We'll put put our coats here by you. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul approved of Stephen's execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles who was rejecting Christ. But Christ was using Paul's hate to advance his church. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. You see, Paul lived a life of works, steeped in a self-righteous identity. But that was about to change. Because Paul was converted through the very gospel message he sought to destroy. You see, Paul wanted grace dead. But grace brought Paul to life. In all of Paul's work, in all of Paul's heritage, in all of Paul's persecution of the church, uh, made Paul the perfect theologian missionary to bring grace to you. Paul's conversion happened there in Acts chapter 9. Look at verse 9. Acts chapter 9, no, verse 3. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul! Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Jesus, who you're persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless. I wonder if they ever got saved. That'd be an interesting 
perspective on life. Hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Verse 8, Saul rose from the ground. Although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. And so they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. What a story. Paul hates Jesus. Paul kills those who love Jesus. Paul's at war with the legacy of Jesus. But Jesus goes to him, knocks him off his feet, throws him to the ground, blinds him, and sends him to be miraculously found in a city of someone he's never met, who happens to be one of the bravest men in the entire New Testament. Jesus tells Ananias in a dream, he needs to find Saul. Which Saul? The one who kills Christians. Yeah. Be like, that was a bad dream. Find that soul and share the gospel with them. I don't think so. Too much hummus. I am not doing that. That's why you don't eat late at night. Acts chapter 9, verse 17, Ananias proves his mettle. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. Friends, when when those scales fell off Saul's eyes, he was converted by the gospel message that he sought to destroy. When Paul wrote Titus chapter 3, verses 3 to 7, one of the most beautiful gospel gold and doctrinally profound and perfect sketches of the gospel, it was a biographical sketch of Paul's conversion. For Paul, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Do you think Paul hated people? Yeah, he killed them. Verse 4 But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, can you imagine Paul writing this, thinking back to that Damascus Road experience, that moment? When everything went dark, but he felt the bright hot. What a thing. Verse 5, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness. Paul had a truckload of those. He was a somebody, but he recognized to God he was a nobody. He was saved, not because of works by done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You see, just because you're religious, it doesn't mean you have no sin. Paul is, man, the prime example If you could get yourself to heaven by works, Paul is the man. But what does Paul say? Can't happen. Just because you're religious, for example, doesn't mean you don't hate. Paul hated. Paul hated and murdered. No matter how expensive the suit on a corpse is, do you know what every corpse has in common? It's dead. Like a 1999 on special at Cole's suit. Or a special custom-made multi-hundred dollar, thousand dollar suit. It don't matter. The corpse is dead. That's works. They do nothing for you. Paul knew he was dead. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared. There on that dusty, dirty, sandy, rocky, dry road to Damascus. He heard the voice of his Savior. And though he deserved death, he received grace. He wasn't saved by his works. He was saved by the mercy of God. And that grace and mercy, it wasn't stingy. It was poured out on him richly so that all of his past was covered up and done with. His present was secured and his future was filled with the brightest hope he could imagine. Paul was transformed from a persecutor of Christ to a passionate worshiper of Christ in a moment, in a work of God. Paul's passion shifted from religion to relationship with his Savior. 
And that relationship was one of worship. These things that Paul had been learning since he was old enough to listen and learn in Hebrew school, like Psalm 29, verse 2, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name, worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Paul started to figure out, oh, this doesn't mean wash my hands with a certain amount of eggshells full of water like the Jews are telling me. This means to make much of God in my soul. Paul finally understood how to ascribe to God the glory due his name. And this kind of worship, it's, it's a way of gladly reflecting back to God the radiance of his worth. What God is worth comes out of our soul in adoration to him. And it can't be done by mere acts of duty. And nor can it be accomplished by merely navel gazing or whatever in your mind. It's, it's a combination of these things. Worship happens when the mind learns the truth of God and the heart responds with affection and our lives resemble one that we know and love whose name is Jesus. That was Paul. From a killer of Christians to a follower of Christ. When our hearts worship and our minds learn the truth of God, our hearts respond with affection and our lives resemble Christ. That's the goal. That's the model we have in Paul. Paul's life began to take on many of the same truths he learned in Judaism, but they were filtered through an affection for God, not not an appetite to work his self into God's favor. We must notice that Paul did not merely exchange religions as some people say. He didn't get rid of Judaism and take on Christianity. He found a relationship with Christ by grace through faith. His passions and affections were forever changed. His heart was transformed. Heart is transformed. What follows? Your life every time. His life was now about Christ, Christ and the worship of him and all things. Paul got it. He understood this life is a vapor. Worship Christ here while you can. He's worth it. We know what made Paul tick, and all of it pointed to Christ. Paul wasn't in this life for Paul. Paul wasn't building a little sub-kingdom of people who loved Paul. Paul wasn't, wasn't about anything that took anything away from Christ. Paul was about giving all things for Christ, to worship Christ, his life, his letters, all for Christ and Christ over all. The second characteristic of Paul that made him such a powerful follower of Christ was he knew he he was active in suffering for Christ. He was active in suffering for Christ. Notice I didn't say he was willing, but he was active in suffering for Christ. How? Well, first he made purposeful, willing, physical sacrifice. Just imagine what you know about Paul for a moment. It's actually not really a whole lot. He was a driven man. He was a passionate man. Without Christ, he was a gifted and effective leader. He was influential in the Sanhedrin in his 20s. Paul could have taken those natural talents and really turned them into many things. But instead, in the power of the Spirit, Paul was a man content with physical sacrifice. Paul could have turned his tent-making business into an empire, I would guess. He was a gifted guy. He could do stuff. He could bring people on his team. He could make things happen. But he didn't. Being content, he served the Lord instead. He was content with what he had. You know, being content with what you have rarely means you don't want anything else. But it often means you're willing to make that physical sacrifice. The contented person experiences the total sufficiency of God's provision for their needs and the sufficiency of God's grace for their circumstances. And often, this comes as a sacrifice of what we want. Imagine if you asked Paul some late evening on the long road from Ephesus to Colossae, hey, would you like lamb chops and hummus for dinner? What do you think Paul would say? It was not, I would like dinner over fasting. I choose dinner. But 
When it came time to serve the Lord or eat, what did Paul choose? Serve the Lord. He chose the Lord. Paul was active in physical sacrifice. The results, it's a very contented man. This is so backwards to how we live today. In our culture, contentment is the product of many years of hard work and a big fat bank account. We're content the moment we get what we want. Well, that's not contentment. That's a redefinition of contentment, and that's actually called greed. In Paul's life, contentment was the product of worshiping Christ and making sacrifices. The contented person believes that God will meet all their necessary material needs, and when God doesn't, not if, but when God doesn't meet all their needs, they're happy to go without. They're active in sacrificing. Have we not lost our minds in regards to stuff in our culture? We have so much stuff. I'm talking about all of us. Everybody has so much stuff. And we cling to so much stuff. And what do we want? More stuff. And what do we do with it? We get more stuff and we store it in stuff spots. We just stuff stuff in there. Like people pay to store stuff they're too proud or whatever to throw away. I've done it before, so don't, don't point fingers. We're all there. Paul says, 1 Timothy 6, 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. You want a lot of stuff? Then be godly and content. And Paul says, you'll have everything you want. The godly person has acquired what the greedy person and the discontent person and the envious person is always searching for and never finding. Contentment, fulfillment, rest, peace, satisfaction. Paul's life teaches us this. Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, I know how to be brought low. I get it. I know how to abound. It's happened. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul is saying I can make any sacrifice necessary because Christ strengthens me. Contrary to popular belief, not a verse about sports. I can give up anything I want. I can want it and give it up because Christ strengthens me. It's interesting that the man who often had nothing, at the end of his life, he's asking for a coat and a Bible. He had nothing. He spent years of his life in jail, and he's the one teaching us about how to deal with having enough. He's one of the most grateful authors you'll ever find in the Bible. It definitely wasn't his circumstances that made him grateful. You can't read a Pauline letter without hearing him give thanks. He didn't need anything on this earth to be thankful. He didn't need anything on this earth to be content. He didn't need anything here to be satisfied. I'd suggest there was no level of anything earthly that Paul needed to be grateful for what God had done to save him. Anything on earth was like white gravy on a chicken fried steak. You don't need it. He was grateful. You know, people who sacrifice are supernaturally grateful. Sacrificial people are grateful people. It's an axiom. I've read of a missionary named Letty Bird Cowman. She often goes by L.B. Cowman. The name's a mouthful. But Mrs. Cowman was a brilliant author. She was a very charismatic leader with a passion to reach the lost of Japan. She and her husband and a few others, they founded the Oriental Mission Society in 1901. 
You can imagine a farm girl from Iowa in 1901 heading to Japan, leaving everything behind. There was quite the shock of society and culture and religion, losing family. She and her husband gave up everything to serve Christ in Japan. In a devotional book, she tells this story to help others understand how she survived all of these sacrifices and persevered through all the trials that came. A fascinating life was hers to lead. And she lost many people to early graves. She was rejected many times by the locals. Even people back here rejected her. She was persecuted, etc. She endured all that sacrifice with joy. All those trials, she had gratitude with the Lord. She writes a fictional account of a farmer. Remember, she's a farm girl from Iowa. She writes a fictional account of a farmer who found a barn where Satan was storing all of the seeds he sows in human hearts. To the farmer's surprise, the seeds of discouragement and doubt were the most numerous of all the others. More numerous than sins like adultery or drunkenness. Satan saw the farmer's intrigue and claimed discouragement and doubt could be made to grow almost anywhere. Satan reluctantly admitted to this fictional farmer that there was one place that he could never get the seeds of discouragement and doubt to grow. Where is that? The farmer asked. Satan answered, in the heart of a grateful person. You see, though, Paul had every reason to be discouraged, every reason to be downtrodden, every reason to doubt God's work because of the sacrifice that he had. Move with joy and passion and gratitude. Why? This earth didn't hold him. He didn't need anything here. He was happy to sacrifice. Sacrifice to the grateful heart is no sacrifice. There was also a great deal of suffering that Paul endured, not by his choice, but imposed upon him. Things that he didn't necessarily pick. He ministered in places like Lystra. You can read the story at Acts chapter 14. The reception was so brutal when neighboring Jews found him in Lystra and they drug him outside of town and they stoned him. That's a good story. They stopped stoning him when they thought he was dead, which makes sense. But then his disciples saw him pop back up and instead of leaving Lystra like every single one else would do, he went back into Lystra and kept preaching the gospel. My point is, Paul's life was not a pursuit of easy. It was rarely uh, any attempt by Paul to avoid the suffering that God put in his path. He was willing to suffer. He was active in sacrifice. He was fine, even with earthly failure. In fact, he pursued ministries that had failure written all over them. Imagine the earthly ministry that Paul engaged in. He didn't pick the Instagram pretty picture ministries. He didn't pick the destined for success crowd. He planted churches in places like Corinth where temple prostitutes outnumbered Christians in the thousands. They were saved out of First Bible Baptist Church of Corinth. These were all a moral wreck. Their souls were full of heartache. They had despair upon despair, complication upon complication woven through every detail of their life, but Paul went after them. Even though in pursuing many of his followers, he was met with suffering because of them. I think we're pretty afraid of suffering. We run from suffering. Paul knew what he was saying in Romans 8.18 when he said, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that's to be revealed to us. He wasn't only talking about health trouble. But he wasn't afraid of suffering. In fact, he was active in suffering on purpose. Turn to Acts chapter 20. A mind-boggling vision of Paul's view of suffering. We're going to major on the minors in this passage. Really, this passage is talking of his, his love for the believers in Ephesus. Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 18, Paul's reminding these Ephesian elders how he served them in humility and tears, how through trials and through boldness, teaching from house to house, he loved them, preaching the gospel. But 
Acts chapter 20, verse 22. Look at that with me. And now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem. So he's saying goodbye. Constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not count my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. I wonder if a reason we're not used to seeing such powerful fruit in the lives of Christians today as we had in other times of church history is that we do everything we possibly can in every way we can imagine to avoid every form of we've ever heard of. And we consider any cost to us in the form of suffering for the advancement of the gospel something that we can decide if it's enough or not. I don't think I should have to pay that much to advance the gospel. We don't put that on our Facebook status, but we may think that. What if Paul considered the gospel unworthy of his suffering? I get it. I believe it's a true apostle up to do that. I get it. But Paul would have been useless if he wasn't content to suffer. God using Paul was synonymous with Paul's suffering. You see this? Don't be afraid of suffering, friend. And don't for a moment plop yourself into a position where thus saith the Lord without considering that the Lord makes his servants suffer. Imagine William Tyndale unwilling to suffer. It would have probably been hundreds of years again before the English Bible was translated. What if John Patton had decided that the cannibals on the New Hebrides Islands were causing too much pain and he wasn't willing to suffer for them anymore? He wasn't going to go to them and preach the gospel any wife and child. That was too much. Should he have packed up and went home? Islands full of Natives would have never heard the gospel nor been saved. Instead, he suffered. God produced amazing fruit. Friends, suffering and serving, they go together like peanut butter and jelly. We don't like it. But read your Bible. What do you see? Those who love God and serve God suffer for God. One verse I can't wait to study. I'm a little nervous about it. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. Make your way back to Colossians and look at that. Paul writing to these believers in Colossae, whom he's never personally met nor visited, says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, That is the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. Paul says, I rejoice in my suffering for your sake and in my flesh I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Bottom line, what's this mean? If you think God saved you to make you happy and wealthy and healthy, look at this verse and tell me what it means. God saved you to use you. God saved you to make you like his son. Giving you what you want won't make you like his son. To make more and better disciples is why he saved us. The greater the cost to us, the more precious the work is to our father. To make more and better disciples. Don't fear suffering. The third character. to the word of Christ. We'll break this down into five headings. The first is Paul was doctrinally productive. Understand that Paul loved people absolutely. Paul loved Jesus absolutely. And Paul loved himself some doctrine. 
Every ology that we study or have, we owe it to the clarity of Paul's pen in some way. Ecclesiology, how church is done, how it's structured. Thank you, Paul. Eschatology, the future of Israel, the hope of Christ's return. Thank you, Paul. Soteriology, salvation by grace through faith. Paul, all these studies of systematic theology, they come from Paul's letters, at least in part. He was doctrinally productive, and he calls us to pursue doctrine as well. Titus chapter 2, verse 1, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Paul tells his understudy Titus uh, to take the life-giving truth of the doctrine, that's sound doctrine, and get it into people, teach it to them, talk to them about it, jam it into their souls, get it to them. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, if you put these things, the context is the truth of God, if you put these things before the brothers, you'll be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths, rather train yourself for godliness. Paul's doctrine was very productive. It was also always directed at the heart. That's why he's so productive in doctrine, knowing that we desperately need doctrine to be growing. Doctrine is the root that taps into the soil where God's riches are waiting. Don't avoid doctrine. Love it. Live by it. Paul did. That's why second, doctrine is profound. Paul's doctrine was profound. Sometimes there's a mediocrity to doctrine. It's become common and accepted and normal. You go to a church's doctrinal statement or an organization's doctrinal statement, it's like, what can we do to say the least in the shortest amount of space and still have it pass for doctrine? It's like five sentences with a few bold words. Come on. Jesus is worth a little more effort to plumb the depths of his unfathomable riches. Paul tells the Ephesians that he was blessed. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, to, to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Doctrine should be profound. Doctrine that is not profound should likely be suspect. Now, doctrine, because it's true, should also be clear. Sometimes ambiguity is a substitute for profundity. It shouldn't be. Doctrine should be clear, and when doctrine is clear, doctrine will be profound. Why? Because the God who's revealed himself to us in truth is clear about himself. He's understandable. He's given us truth that is clear and understandable. Paul loved to scale the heights of God's glory through doctrine. He's like our guide leading us up to Mount Everest. He, he gives us doctrine here, gets us to the base, gives us doctrine here, gives us doctrine here, gives us doctrine here, gives us doctrine here. All of a sudden, we're at the top, and he says, look around and see what you have. Romans chapter 11, 33 to 36. Listen to what he's done. It's simple but profound. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? All of your kids can answer those questions. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Doctrine. Paul loved it. Paul was changed by it. And third, notice doctrine is practical. Oftentimes, lazy people who don't want to expend the effort to learn doctrine throw a straw man argument at it saying, well, it's just not practical. Friend, that's what doctrine is, is practical. That's the point of every single Pauline epistle. Doctrine always gives way to practice. For example, Romans 11 that we just finished, what we just read was getting us to the top of Mount Everest to show us Christian Living 101. Romans chapter 12, the first two verses. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. If this is who God is, the doctrine, then this is how you'll live the application. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, by the testing you may discern what is the will of God that is good and acceptable and perfect. So resting on 11 chapters of profound doctrine, Paul calls each believer to an extreme spiritual act of worship, giving oneself as a living sacrifice. 
Doctrine gives rise to dedication to Christ. That's Paul's normal MO. Doctrine leads to practice. Doctrine leads to application. Doctrine leads to life. People that say doctrine isn't practical either haven't studied doctrine or aren't sure of its purpose. Its purpose is to be useful in our pursuit of the Lord. Doctrine is truly just an assimilation of God's word. So doctrine holds the same qualities of God's word if it's based on God's word. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 explains the practical nature of doctrine very well. All scriptures breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Doctrine infused with God's word brings out God's truth in a way that helps our souls be changed by the picture of Christ that we get. We can't come as close to God's character as Scripture brings us into God's presence with the Spirit pushing us to understanding these things without being changed. Doctrine changes us in God's timing, by His plan, by the power of His Spirit, in His will, not ours, but God's guarantee is that it will change us. Doctrine changes us. Fourth, Paul was doctrinally precise. Turn to Romans chapter 3. We'll see the precision of Paul's doctrine. He was not just some big picture guy. He got into the nitty gritty any chance he got. Read Romans chapter 3 beginning in verse 21. Just imagine what Paul's talking about here. He's leaving no wiggle room for any error. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although, Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift to the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness Because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins, it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It's excluded. It's amazing. It's profound. It's precise. And your boasting is excluded. It's practical. Fifth, Paul was doctrinally protective. Today, it seems that unity at all costs is the way. Appeasement, no matter the capitulation, is the lingua franca of doctrine. Paul would not agree. He would not allow doctrine supreme in Pauline life and worship and ministry. Speaking to the Corinthians about false teachers, Paul tells us to be wary, to be careful, to be clear. Not to be gracious and overlooking. With a brother caught in sin, oh, be gentle, he says, Galatians chapter 6. Watch out for your own soul. With false teaching, get rid of it. Be ruthless towards it. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 to 15. For some faithful workmen disguising themselves as apostles of Christ, and no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no surprise of his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Paul says false teachers will do the same. You know, I know of no books that have as the title, read this book, it contains doctrine that will ruin your soul. You know, but I do have a few books that, have, that should have that as the subtitle. Paul says, look out for Paul teachers. He's not afraid to name names. He's not afraid to go after their character. He tells us, you know, normally the the three G's describe the false teacher's pursuit, the gold, the glory, or the girls. He calls Hymenaeus and Alexander out in 1 Timothy 1.19. Paul's a spiritual door kicker. He's not going to allow false doctrine to infiltrate the church. In Galatians, he attacked the view of the Judaizers that they came in with a new and different gospel. Galatians chapter 1 verse 9, as we've said before, So now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Do you know what accursed means? It means to be damned. Paul's not really smoothing it over there. The question is, why was Paul so harsh with false teachers? The answer was simple. He loved you. He loved Christ. 
He wouldn't let people not understand truly who Christ was and what Christ had done. As we work through the letter to Colossae, you'll see that most of it is about some sort of false teaching that had infected them or was at least pushing them to misunderstanding Christ and his work. And we'll weave this last point through our text next week. But Paul's life was a powerful force for Christ because Paul loved the body of Christ. And friends, when we know God and we recognize who we are and we realize that he sent his son for us to live the life that we couldn't, to die the death that we deserved, we, you'll find love for one another, just like Paul did. Romans chapter 12, verse 5, Paul says, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. And as members of each other, we'll live with and serve with and love each other together. May we strive to follow Paul's example as he followed Christ. Let me pray and then you'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you for the life of Paul as he pursued Christ in such an f- earthly, fleshy way that we can relate to with his struggles and his trials, his suffering, his heartache and yet his love for his Savior. May we live like him as he lived like Christ. And may we bring Christ to others, just as Paul has done for us. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.